at the Bank of England. Uh, and I'm also uh, co-chair, uh, along with Colin, uh, of the uh, Financial Stability Board's uh, Financial uh, Innovation Network. Thank you for joining us today. This is the second of two webinars we have on fintech topics. Uh, this one will be focused on the topic of big tech in emerging market and developing economies, uh, something on which uh, the Financial Stability Board has just delivered a report uh, to the G20 group of governments. Um, to start, we will give the floor to Joe Noss from the Secretariat, who will cover some housekeeping topics. Thank you, Tom. So three bits of housekeeping. First, we ask, please, that only the panellists and the moderators use their video feed. Uh, that's to maintain the quality of the call and to reduce bandwidths. Otherwise, please, can you keep your uh, video turned off? And can we ask everyone to keep their microphones on mute during the call? Uh, unless they are speaking. Um, second thing, if you wish to intervene during the call or to ask a question, please do so via the chat function. If in WebEx you look on the right-hand side of your screen uh, at the list of participants, at the top of that list there is someone called AAA, submit your question here. That person is me. If you hover your mouse over AAA, submit your question here and press chat, uh, you can type your question into the chat box and uh, we will receive it. Um, finally, please note that today's event is being recorded. Uh, if you leave your microphone unmuted, you may therefore be recorded. So please bear that in mind. Um, and if you need any assistance or help, um, please send a message to me uh, through, the, through the chat function um, in the manner I just mentioned. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you, Joe. And, uh... I managed to break the rules already by not having my video on during the introduction, so apologies to that. Um, so to start uh, the discussion, uh, we're going to give the floor to Harish Natarajan from the uh, World Bank, uh, uh, recognised the FSB's uh, study uh, and the production of our report. Uh, so Harish, uh, you're going to give us a couple of minutes uh, just outlining the key features uh, of your study. Uh, Harish, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm just waiting for the shared content to be enabled for me. And here it is. Um, so, so hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. And thank you, Tom, for, um, for the opportunity to uh, share, share a few insights from the, uh, from the study. Uh, the, the, this report, uh, which we recently published, uh, kind of covers the impact of big techs on emerging markets and developing economies and, and analyzes whether there are any specific uh, financial stability implications. Uh, this was done uh, by our subgroup uh, under, under FIN, uh, based on a lot of interviews with uh, big tech players and also a survey amongst the FSB membership and the regional consultative groups. Uh, and uh, some of the key findings uh, are what I will I'll present today, and then of course we have opportunity to discuss uh, during the panel discussions. Uh, one of the one of the um, observations was um, big tech, uh, the, the penetration of big tech services in uh, in emerging markets and developing economies uh, is, is is quite different from um, the uh, kind of uh, uh, in developed economies. Uh, in in terms of uh, in some countries, while it is only uh, mobile money and payment services, which where um, where big techs are active. But the penetration of them uh, in terms of the number of users, uh, kind of the volumes of payments going through them relative to the GDP, this is quite significant. And then similarly, uh, in some uh, some of the emerging markets, we already see a lot of other financial services becoming uh, being offered by uh, big techs, uh, either in partnership or on their own. Uh, and that's also becoming a significant portion of the overall credit flow in the economy uh, in that particular context. Um, and um, there is also qualitative difference in the, uh, in the type of big tech companies which are active. Uh, in many cases, it is um, uh, the typical um, e-commerce um, platforms, but also a very well-funded new, um, new entrants uh, like ride-hailing companies, and then also the telecom uh, providers. If you look at the demand side drivers, um, there are the typical um, uh, kind of uh, intuitive expectations, like um, uh, there is a high level of financial exclusion, so there's a quite a bit of unmet demand. Uh, there's also this growth of uh, telephony services, penetration of that, uh, youth and tech savvy uh, population. And there's also very um, uh, high desire for uh, low-cost services, uh, given the um, uh, given the uh, lack of uh, customized products available in, in the markets. And if you look at the uh, supply side, um, 
um, drivers. Uh, one of the big drivers we noticed is um, many of the centers for um, big tech companies that are operating in these markets uh, get into financial services to actually uh, protect and grow their core business. Uh, and for example, if a ride hailing company in an emerging market is, is like trying to increase the number of drivers to grow their business, they hit a constraint that um, the banks in the countries are not in a position to, um, to kind of lend to the drivers to uh, to kind of own their cars and, and, and kind of participate in the, the right hailing platform. So the big tech companies are, are forced in a way to innovate uh, and see how they can uh, provide the services. And similarly, uh, because of the lack of penetration of payment services, e-commerce companies uh, opening emerging markets be constrained to then also start uh, getting into some form of um, uh, uh, kind of uh, trying to provide some form of payment services, uh, in some cases in partnership with banks, in some cases uh, on their own. Um, so that's one big driver. There are, of course, other um, other drivers like um, uh, kind of they want to look at uh, accessing customer data so that they can kind of customize their core products better. Uh, they also want to diversify their revenue streams beyond the core technology business. And this is particularly the case for telecom companies where the markets are extremely competitive uh, in the emerging markets. And of course, there's also this desire to support uh, financial inclusion. Uh, all of this, of course, um, and has significant amount of benefits in terms of um, uh, diversification of the financial sector, uh, expanding financial inclusion, uh, and, and then also kind of bringing in more dynamism, uh, dynamism to be able to market by bringing in competition. Uh, we are seeing uh, a, a good effect of uh, the big tech companies kind of in, in entering emerging markets, uh, kind of, uh, making the income in banks, income in institutions becoming more tech savvy, innovating more, investing more in technology, uh, investing uh, more in new products, etc. So I think there's a lot of good things, but then of course there are a few um, risks which are, are worth highlighting. Uh, the first is uh, is about um, uh, the way the big tech uh, firms interact with the users, there could be potential issues related to consumer protection. Uh, it could be uh, issues related to um, uh, data protection and privacy. And some of it is also because of the uh, very um, uh, uh, kind of limited financial literacy potentially in emerging markets. Many times the users of these services are first time users. So I think there are specific considerations uh, uh, in the emerging markets. Then there are um, concerns related to uh, the scale and concentration of big tech activities, they can become very big, very fast, uh, and dominate the market very quickly. Uh, there are also implications for the business model of um, incumbents and whether they are able to adapt to that uh, and, and can pose certain risks. And then there are concerns related to uh, the operational reliability of some of the services because of the uh, very long uh, value chains which are created for providing payment services. Uh, and a lot of it is not fully visible to the regulators. Uh, there are also concentration risks related to um, uh, kind of um, a provision of certain services get concentrated in the few providers. So I think those are some of the uh, the key risks. And of course, these risks depend also on the nature of um, uh, big tech activity. It also depends on whether they are entering on their own, whether they're competing, uh, whether they are uh, partnering. Um, so that, that also has an implication. Um, very quickly on some of the policy implications because of all of this. Uh, one thing which comes out very clearly is um, the emerging markets embraced um, uh, at least the basic innovation of, you know, on the payment services side. And so that in, in a way illustrates the positive role of regulation. Many of them uh, already started doing uh, kind of test and learn, uh, wait and see uh, for the precursors of the regulatory sandbox uh, or kind of about 10 years back when, when these things were um, not necessarily very, very common in the emerging markets. Uh, and similarly, the um, uh, there are, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are implications depending on how the uh, incumbents uh, enter, uh, how the incumbents interact with the new players. Uh, in some cases, they have been very strong partnership with them so set up. In some cases, they are very direct competition. And so the implications from a policy perspective will, will vary uh, depending on that. Um, there are also um, uh, the entry of the big tech companies has really forced um, the discussion uh, on the same risk, same regulation principle. Uh, in many of the uh, many of the uh, emerging markets, uh, and that they had to create very specific regulation focusing on the activity. For example, creating regulations related to e-money, uh, recognizing that as a new service, as a new activity, uh, which both banks and non-banks can provide. Uh, so, like this, they had to um, uh, kind of adapt to that, and this is this is a consideration which has to be uh, kept in mind going forward as well. Uh, there are uh, also implications related to data, data governance. Uh, what is the legitimate use of customer data? Uh, what what is the role of um, uh, uh, what is the role of consent? How do you secure consent? Uh, and then also um, how do you manage the data? Or who is responsible in case of any problems, etc. There are also implications on operational risk, as I mentioned earlier. 
and, and more importantly, there are implications related to um, uh, uh, safeguarding of customer funds. And this is uh, a particular problem in some emerging markets where some of the legal frameworks related to uh, safeguarding of customer funds, keeping the bankruptcy remote, uh, penetration of deposit insurance services, et cetera, uh, can be limited. So that makes it all the more important uh, to, uh, to look at this from a, from a policy perspective. So, uh, so I hope I gave you a very quick flavor of the um, uh, of the, the key findings of the paper. I'll be happy to um, participate in the discussions later on. Uh, and with this, let me pass it back to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Harit. A uh, huge amount of content uh, in a very short period of time. Um, we're going to move to our first panel, uh, where we'll hear from uh, a range of private sector experts from across the globe, uh, and to uh, to my uh, colleague Colin uh, will, will take up the reins. Uh, Colin, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tom, and and thank thanks Harris for setting the scene for for the panel today. Um, well, further to the introduction by Harris on the findings of the report, uh, this first panel uh, will try to have more in-depth discussion on the benefit challenges and risk of big tech in emerging markets. Well, we have a panel of distinguished speakers from the five sector of us today. Uh, these firms have been highly successful in offering financial services in the emerging markets. Um, to kickstart the process, I would like to begin by inviting each um, panelist to introduce themselves and talk about what lies behind the success of their firms in offering the financial services in their respective market. And uh, well, in the interest of time, helpful if each, can, each panelist can keep it to say two, three to four minutes. First, um, uh, can I invite Ahmed of STP Pay uh, to give us uh, some idea about um, ST, what STC Pay is doing, and uh, uh, what's the experience in in the you know uh, emerging market? Thank you, Colin. Uh, this is uh, Ahmed Al Anzi, the CEO of STC Pay. Uh, STC Bay is an EMI licensed entity from the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia. We are a wallet provider. Uh, we provide multiple services, including remittance and payment uh, and uh, prepaid card and card in general. Uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, we were very successful in the past, uh, you know, couple of uh, months and almost a year and a half uh, since the full launch. Uh, there are multiple factors that contribute to, to our success um, in STC Bay. Uh, starting from the country Fijian itself, uh, the Fijian 2030, that is uh, one of their programs called the Financial Service Development Program that encourage uh, moving to a cashless society. And also having a, a, a central bank that is opening up uh, for the uh, uh, for the fintech players to come and test their product and services, allowing innovation to prosper and uh, making sure that they done this through a controlled uh, environment uh, called the sandbox to make sure that they don't uh, risk uh, or risk that might hurt the customers or any sort of risk that is also mentioned in the report. The uh, other factors, which is you have to have a shareholder that understand the potential uh, because STC Bay is part of the, uh, is a company 100% owned by STC, which is uh, the largest telco in the Middle East. So this is uh, pretty uh, important to have a shareholder that understand the potential of the financial technology and the movement that towards that. And then you have the partners that you're dealing with because we are a fintech that is, you know, we rely on certain players in the market. We have more than 11 partners that, you know, we are working with today locally and internationally. And definitely a customer that is looking for uh, products and services. Alhamdulillah, Saudi Arabia is a, a country with a young generation that is tech savvy. Uh, the adaptation of smartphone is extremely high. This is where we, as players, we want to uh, benefit out of that reach. And definitely the team. You have to have the right team that has the ambitious, the dedication and the motivation to do so. This is, in a nutshell, what we uh, see as the success factors and what, what is SDC being generated. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Well, I, certainly, I think uh, the public sector's uh, conducive, you know, policies, uh, encouragement is are certainly, you know, useful catalyst to kind of, you know, 
prompt the development of the adoption of new technology. Well, next, uh, can I uh, turn to Paula of uh, Mikado Libra? Paula? Is, is Paula here? Um, Colin, um, Paula is having connection issues. Uh, oh, we're okay. trying to get her reconnected, but you, you might like to move on to uh, the next speaker. Yeah, sure, maybe sure. return to Paula. No problem. In that case, uh, well, can I uh, first invite uh, Alisa of Google to share with us uh, Google's activities, financial activities in the emerging market? Thank you, Colin. Um, yes, I'm Alyssa Davis and I lead Google's public policy work on payments. Um, so we were really interested to see the findings of the report um, and very happy um, to have participated in it. Um, so in terms of Google Pay's activities, um, so our, our key product in this financial services space is Google Pay, which aims to make money helpful, simple and accessible for our users. And we do this in close partnership with financial partners, as well as with the existing regulatory and financial systems. And the place that we have had most impact with this product so far is in India. So we launched this product back in September 2017. And within 18 months, it had over 45 million uh, monthly active users. So we saw phenom phenomenal growth from the beginning. And in terms of the main reasons for the success that we've seen in India and in other markets, uh, the key thing that we see is partnerships. Um, and that is really central to how we approach building and scaling our payments product globally. So both partnerships with government and regulators, but also partnership with banks. So um, in terms of the partnership with government and regulators in India, we worked really closely with the MPCI and the RBI as they were building their real-time payment system, UPI, and we built GPay on top of that. And as part of that project, we needed to engage heavily with the RTP network itself and its underlying design challenges. And in terms of partnership with banks, Google Pay works with any bank on UPI in India, but we've gone further to integrate with lots of different payment service providers. So this creates greater resilience, better performance and more choice for users. And in the last couple of years, we've since extended our partnership with banks to expand financial inclusion. So we're working with lots of different banks to make the loans process to customers simpler, quicker and more direct. Um, so, so really partnership, the central driver for all our success um, in India and, and in other markets. Well, thank you, Alisa. I, I, think, I think the model of Google is quite different from, from other, you know, uh, like payment service providers. It, 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 it certainly more emphasis on partnering with, with, you know, the incumbent payers rather than actually providing your own, you know, services, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. I'm not sure whether uh, Paula is how we connect. I'm sorry, we're tr still trying to uh, connect Paula. Do we want to maybe move on to Deviani and then we yeah, can... Yeah, sure, uh, sure. We, 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 can, we can move it. Move on to Deviani first. Can I, in that case, uh, invite Deviani to share with us uh, about the story of MPSA? Sure, thanks, Colin. Thanks for having me. Um, so I, I have the commercial team for Mpesa Africa, um, and maybe just to give you a little bit of a brief of Mpesa and you know what we what we've done in financial services. Um, so I think uh, very similar to what um, a number of the others have said in terms of partnerships, that's absolutely a, a key part of our future growth. But maybe just to take us uh, back and give the audience a bit more uh, a flavor as to you know what's made us successful to date. So there's a number of um, or almost 400 now live um, mobile money services globally, and about half of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and with about six deployments in PESA in the last year, in 2019, accounted for about 50% of the volume of transactions and about a third of the value uh, transacted on mobile money. Um, so what sort of enables that or what's created that um, you know, ability to scale um, is really just a, you know, a couple of things. So I think mobile money has been a very different business from um, you know, core telco. And I think uh, one of the drivers mentioned in the report was diversification and, and competition. And absolutely, that's that's the reason why a number of players have um, have you know entered the the market. But it is a very different business. It's got a much longer return on capital um, than uh, a sort of core telco. And you know we are very much still a part of the telco business. So 
Um, what's really enabled uh, the growth to date has been sort of passionate, dedicated, really patient leadership um, and willingness to invest for the long term. Um, and I think maybe unlike some of the other big tech uh, financial services models featured here, uh, mobile money is, while it is digital and it, it's, you know, it is a digital wallet, it is highly reliant still on physical infrastructure and on having that kind of ubiquitous distribution and the reach uh, that goes beyond what traditional banking offers today. Um, to give you a sense, you know, in, in our markets, on average across players, not, not just in PESA, but there's you know, over seven um, times the number of agents and there are ATMs in, in most of our markets and about 20x the number of agents and there are bank branches. Um, and in, in some of our markets, those numbers are significantly higher. Um, so it's that distribution network and that reach and you know, enabling um, us to be the bridge between the cash and digital economies that, that really drives that. Um, and then perhaps sort of the ability to drive behavior change and, and create that um, you know, switch from, from cash and just start, you know, start transacting digitally um, and, and building the brand um, to do that has, has been a major driver. And I, and I can't um, in this forum especially not mention regulation. I think regulatory support has been absolutely critical from the time that we started and, and as we've evolved the business from being kind of um, you know, primarily a remittance, uh, domestic remittance provider to becoming a sort of much wider payments um, provider and now you know, having uh, um, having scale across other financial services as well, including uh, credit, savings, insurance, and um, some work in, in wealth management as well. Um, and as that sort of ecosystem develops, it's, it's absolutely about partnerships, as some of my colleagues have just mentioned. I'll stop there. Colin, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you Joe, yeah. Colin, Joe Noss here. Just to let you know that um, Powder is now connected, so hopefully we can send it over. <laughs> no problem. Uh, we, we can move on and then uh, so see, you know, get connected again, we, we can talk to her. I, I'm Hi. sorry. I, 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 I can see Paula, right? I'm Welcome. here. I, <laughs> Welcome back. I was, <laughs> sorry. I was no having problem. some trouble with the audio, so sorry I'm now connected from my phone, but I can hear you really well right now. No problem at all. And I think in that case, uh, uh, are you are you ready to talk right now, right? Yes, if you can no hear problem. me cor correctly from the phone, I'm fine. Yes, loud and clear. Well, in that case, we are actually uh, on the first you know, question of the panel, actually. Uh, just uh, uh, it would be helpful if you can, you know, uh, uh, give us, you know, a, a brief introduction of 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 your firms. Uh, what what lies behind the success of your firm? You know, in your market. Perfect. Yes. Well, um, Mercado Libre is today the biggest marketplace and e-commerce site in Latin America. So uh, some years ago, like seventeen years ago, when we wanted to transform the Mercado Libre buying experience into a digital in which payment can be processed online real time. We basically saw that in Latin America, that type of services did not exist. So that was how Mercado Pago was born. Mercado Pago is today the fintech part of Mercado Libre ecosystem. We started by processing digital payments at that stage. Then we realized that we completed that full stack of technology that would also help other people wanting to process digital payments outside Mercado Libre. So at that step, we opened our platform. We started processing payments everywhere in Latin America in this digital phase. And then we realized that Paula, uh, sorry, oh. just to let you know, we've lost your audio. <laughs> Can you, you hear us, Paula? Paula, you're showing us connected here in Basel, um, but we can't hear you, I'm afraid. This type can't of solution for our users, first our sellers that then wanted to access the rest of the financial services they were needing. 
And finally, we saw that this type of, of pieces could be also combined to start serving people, regular people, not sellers, with the same demands. So if you look at Mercado Pago nowadays, we are providing alternative credits, we are providing cards, we are providing access to asset management, we are providing uh, access to payments and to process and collecting digital money, both in physical and digital world. So that was our evolution, and that's how today we are serving millions of persons in our regions that uh, traditional did not have access to this type of, of solutions. Uh, thank you, Paula. I, I think certainly uh, your company is, you know, targeting at a particular, you know, uh, market segment that uh, other, you know, the traditional financial institution may not be, you know, uh, filling it, it up very well. And certainly that mm -hmm. is one, one particular advantage that we have seen uh, for for the big tech company. Yes, that, that's correct. If you look at, um, once again, Latin America, the, the pyramid of, of the population, traditionally, uh, let's say the incumbents started serving the top of that pyramid in payments, in credits, in, in investments. And I, I think what FinTech did was basically starting from the, from the bottom of that pyramid and getting to to serve many of these persons that were out of the system if you look at for example pos in in the regions uh, we were able to deploy more than four million uh, mpos's that now give access to many persons to to collect money through digital payments we were not cannibalizing traditional sellers that already had that type of solutions. We created more than 7 million investment accounts. And when you look at the average of the amount invested, it's not more than $80. So those type of solutions that are created through technology, technology basically for us is the difference for scaling, is the difference for bringing innovation and being able to think all of these flows directly from a mobile phone screen and also allowing us to create a lot of things in the back end such as screenings fraud prevention models um the the analysis of thousands of variables in order to provide a credit or alternative credit so technology for us is the very good explanation on how can we do things differently and can bring innovation and bring a solution uh, that is also effective in, in, in financial and revenue terms for these very new segments of, of our populations. I think that's such a very, very important financial inclusion purposes. Well, well thank you, Paula. Uh, perhaps uh, I would like to turn to another subject, you know, um, about the impact of big tech on the market structure. Uh, uh, based on the introduction of Harris, I think uh, we noticed that big tech can be competitor or, or, or partner with the, you know, incumbent financial institution. Well, um, I, I'm interested to learn from the panelists how their firms have been, you know, interacting with the incumbent financial in institutions. First, uh, can I... Uh, uh, see the view from Ahmed. Is your firm filling a market gap or is actually competing head on with the existing financial institutions? Uh, today, uh, as STC Bay, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, partners uh, include half of the banks in Saudi. Today, we are working with them by providing us uh, some of the services. And definitely, there are services that you know, we compete. And there are services that you know is 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 you know we are uh, here to fill the way that is is, is the user are, are doing transactions today. Uh, as a Saudi, uh, we're with uh, a free economy in place that is everybody can uh, do uh, the, the 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 way that is is is, is uh, good for them. Uh, for us, uh, we. Uh, uh, currently host our balance and accounts, our safeguarding with, with, with almost a couple of banks here in Saudi. 
We use their services to provide payments for us. We interact with the customer and they provide us with, with the different services. We work with Western Union as an international body to provide us with the reach around the globe. And we work with Visa to provide us the reach on their network. We provide the Saudi, Saudi local scheme called MEDA on their uh, almost uh, more than 400 point, 400,000 point of sale in the market. So we use uh, those guys. Uh, collaboration is always good. Uh, to make sure that the market is growing and benefiting everybody in that market. The good thing is the regulator is also enforcement to accommodate that. And, you know, uh, with, 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 the, with certain, uh, you know, bodies that you have to have the government support starting from a regulator to make sure that, you know, everybody has a free or, or, or a field to play on uh, with the right structure or on the market. Uh, this is why no is managed by a company uh, called Meta. Uh, so this is one thing, and their strategy is to enable play in that market. Uh, not just banks, everybody that is licensed from the central bank can do and perform transaction. And this is a good and healthy uh, way to do things. Customer are changing, changing rapidly. Technology is changing uh, the way that people interact with each other. So they are looking for uh, something unique. So for our, from our side, we see a very great collaboration uh, so far. Uh, yes, there are uh, certain industry that you know or certain products that we compete with each other, but this is an this is the norm in any free market. I mean, I, actually, from your you know description, I sense a a, a strong collaboration rather than uh, very intense competition. You know among the different payers in the financial systems. Well, definitely, uh, there, is, there, 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 there will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, competition. Uh, and this is the good thing, because if you don't have a competitor, you will sit and relax and do nothing, and you will not change, and you will ha still have certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, privilege. Uh, the good thing is, you know, in, in, in our market, there are multiple players. Yes, we compete. There are a lot of... Uh, Players are coming in in the pipeline, and this is good for us uh, as 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 a, uh, a player that is uh, rolling our sleeves and wants to make sure that you know we get as much as we can market share. But towards the end of the day, it is you know in a free economy, the the uh, uh, market participant will provide their services, and the customer will choose which one is fit their needs. Competition will bring benefit to the customers. At the end of the day, right? Thank you. Well, next, I'd like to, 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 you know, pose the same question to, to Alisa of Google. Well, well, Alisa, well, I understand that, that actually, uh, for example, from my own observation for some of the, you know, big tech, for example, in China, they're actually exporting technology to the incumbent financial institution alongside with their own, you know, provision of financial services. I'm not sure whether for Google, you are actually partnering with other financial institutions in such a way that you are actually helping them to 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 improve or enhance, you know, uh, to provide better service. Yes, so we definitely see the incumbent financial services firms as partners um, because we really think that there's mutual benefit in those types of partnerships. Because if we partner with banks, then, you know, the banks have expertise in financial systems, whereas we as a consumer tech company have experience in making complicated processes simple for users and, and building a really great interface. So, but we both have this common goal of helping more people to take part in digital payments. So one example of a partnership that is that is working in a very interesting way is our new product in the US, which is going to be launching and testing phases um, in the coming months. So this is called Project Cash, um, and it's a digital platform that enables depository institutions to offer checking and saving accounts to users. So this product is bringing the best of Google's design and technology, but combining it with the financial expertise and regulatory experience of our banking partners, and we wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, so Citibank has been our key partner on this, but we've also announced partnerships with Stanford Credit Union um, and six others. So those include Bank Mobile, BBVA, BMO Harris, the Coastal Community Bank, First Independence Bank, and SF SEFCU. Um, so 
the range of partners there, I think, shows that, you know, we're bringing together the best of what technology companies can do with the best of what banks and credit unions can do. Like that you're actually providing, uh, you know, technological solutions for, for banks, right? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. That, that, that sounds very interesting. Uh, I'd like to, to, to turn to yet another even more topical issue. We covered that uh, briefly uh, at the panel yesterday. Is this about the impact of COVID? Well, it was discussed yesterday that COVID did have the impact, impact of, you know, accelerating the adoption of technology in red tech and sub tech. Um, well, I'm not sure whether uh, from the angle of our panelists today, whether they have seen the similar trend in terms of the, you know, uh, COVID's impact on your, you know, financial services. Well, is this just a, you know, kind of, a, you know, uh, quantity increase in the demand for your service or actually that would bring, you know, or create additional demand for additional or new types of services. On that, can I uh, first uh, see the wheel of Paula? Paula, still with, you're still with us? Sure, Colin. Yes, um, and, and, and this was something that I believe no one expected. So if you look at Latin America, in many of the countries, we had very severe quarantines. So that was basically people not being able to be in the streets. So this brought a very big new necessity to many of the entrepreneurs and the SMBs that was basically they needed to redefine and reinvent the way in which they maintained active. So for us, that was um, a, a big way to help them reinvent their model of, of businesses in very, very short period of time. And that was basically thanks to um, us being enabled of technologies that we like to say that are agnostic to the sophistication these type of users have. So in a few weeks, you see in the case of Argentina, for example, 75,000 new SMBs getting into the digital payments arena, starting to collect their sales through links of payments, through QR codes, through MPOSs. And this basically allowed them to maintain their activity, to maintain their employees, direct and both indirect collaborators that now were able to maintain their jobs um, and basically to survive. So yes, we saw a big impact. We saw volumes increasing above 200%, not only when processing payments, but if we look at those same people that collect money, then they need to pay staff on a daily basis needs. So we provide a wallet from where they can pay the, their utility bills, they can recharge their phones, they can recharge the, 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 the card with the one they travel. So all of these flows also increased really, really fast and of course above our expectations. Um, and for us, it was like a shortcut of let's say a year, year of a half, and a half of what we expected to grow in the digital arena. So strong impact above COVID for us this year. Paula, certainly I think that, that that's kind of a you know, worldwide phenomenon. Well, last year, can I also uh, pose the same question to Diani? Uh, has your company felt, you know, the effect of, you know, so uh, COVID so far in terms of, you know, the, the traffic or the demand, you know, required for your service? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I think Impressa is really a reflection of the economy in, in our markets. And so we've seen, you know, a whole range of, you know, different reactions. So I think at, at the beginning, when there was a lot of uncertainty, we saw a huge uh, jump in the deposits. So in, in some markets, it was as high as 20% increase in, in customer deposits, just for safekeeping for a short period of time when people didn't quite know, you know, what um, what the lockdown situation was going to be, how long, uh, you know, what the impact would be on their cash flows. Um, and then very quickly after COVID hit, we've had regulatory responses across 
all of our markets actually requesting that as uh, digital payment providers, we support digitization and move away from cash to enable, um, you know, to enable kind of an uptake of, of digital transactions and, and a reduction in sort of cash uh, and you know transmission of COVID by cash. So we've we've had to zero rate uh, transaction fees across uh, peer to peer transactions in all of our markets, and in some cases also. Uh, for consumer to business payments, for bank to wallet transfers, et cetera. So that's had an immense impact positively in terms of you know, the elasticity that we're starting to see. That's obviously created um, a, a huge rise in the number of transactions. The volume of transactions has gone up to, um, you know, dramatically on the digital side. And we, we hope to see that um, you know, new habit uh, stick beyond, you know, uh, beyond this period of zero rating. Um, so obviously on the on the uh, revenue side, we've, we've taken a big hit. Um, but we've also seen that you know all agent and cash based transactions have actually come down significantly, and that again is a reflection of the amount of cash available and people making this switch to digital. Um, I think McKinsey put out some numbers recently saying the COVID impact uh, on payments in Africa this year would be about a 10% contraction overall, rather than the Previously projected 23% increase, and, and that's definitely something that that we're you know, we're seeing in our markets. I think certainly uh, COVID is certainly a bad thing that had you know has a devastating effect on on the society on the economy, but it does you know present opportunity to to the tech sector. The other day when I talked to the you know fintech company in Hong Kong, and uh, we all actually felt that uh, that is quite an unprecedented opportunity that can really motivate people to change their behavior, to change the mentality about you know, switching to technology. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think it is important that, um, well, the tech sector, the, the public sector can, can really seize this opportunity to respond very timely to this, you know, uh, unprecedented trend. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane. And uh, I think, um, uh, we have almost come. We have almost come to an end to the end of this section, and uh, I think it's almost time time's up for this section. In that case, perhaps I can uh, hand over to to Tom uh, for you know starting the the second section of the second panel of this workshop. Well, lastly, thank you for all the panelists uh, for joining this section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin, and uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, really interesting stuff. Um, so the next panel have uh, a focus on uh, the role of policy uh, and views uh, from both uh, the official sector uh, in the form of Liz Jacobs, uh, from uh, the Bank of International Assessments, uh, from John, and then also from an academic, uh, uh, Dirk. And I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves a little more when they start their remarks. Think about the positive role that policy can play in supporting uh, safe and sustainable innovation which benefits, uh, which benefits users of fintech and users of finance. To start off, um, we will have a discussion about uh, where the panelists see the biggest opportunities uh, from uh, big tech, emerging market, and developing economies, and where they see the policy implications. Um, so uh, to open up, uh, perhaps um, Liz, you would like to go first on where you see the policy implications and the biggest opportunities from big tech in emerging markets. Sure. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you fine, Liz. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the FSB for uh, hosting the workshop uh, and inviting me to participate. Um, I do want to um, uh, uh, note um, and update the agenda that um, I'm speaking uh, uh, from uh, the, as an SEC employee, uh, having recently completed a detail at the Treasury Department. Uh, as a result, um, probably this disclaimer uh, will not surprise most folks, uh, but the Securities and Exchange Commission disclaims responsibility for any private publication or statement of any SEC employee or commissioner. Uh, these remarks express my view and don't necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners, or other members of the staff. Um, I will tell you, I believe it's a challenge uh, for me to be on this panel uh, along with Dirk and John Frost, 
uh, two of the most prolific uh, authors in this area and two fintech uh, rock stars. So uh, I'll do my best. Um, I think what I had wanted to do was maybe uh, take your uh, question, Tom, and, and actually raise it up um, uh, a level in terms of looking how one looks at and identifies what these opportunities uh, and policy implications uh, may be. Um, where do you start on uh, conducting this type of fintech uh, analysis and identify their implications for both advanced and emerging markets? And actually, let me raise that up a level and say uh, another question is after what 2020 has served up for us, uh, does anyone out there even remember 2017? And I'll point to 2017 and refresh recollections because that actually was when uh, the FSB first undertook to broadly analyze uh, FinTech and conduct the type of policy analysis um, that will hopefully lead to um, uh, filling in some of the, the questions uh, that get raised. Um, that was the, the first time the FSB sort of uh, did an overall overarching report on looking at um, the policy implications in light of sort of the, the massive uh, digitization of financial services. Uh, the report today is actually one of the uh, the proud progeny of that that 2017 framework, um, and I think uh, particularly when uh, we will be talking probably about you know principles applied by regulators, um, how the FSB developed its framework um, was first defining uh, what the scope of fintech activities would be covered by this analysis, including looking at their primary economic function. Um, looking at it from a technology neutral analysis and then using case studies to draw out potential uh, risks and benefits. Uh, and I would say, and probably the Secretariat would support this notion that conducting policy analysis that's fit for purpose can be painstaking. Uh, in this case, it's meant developing glossaries that simplify very technical terms uh, to promote a common understanding. Um, so that you can have conversations about opportunities and, and policy implications. And also, I think, searching for data in a constantly evolving area. Um, I think the, the good news is that the 2017 report has proved fit for purpose and, and uh, uh, discussing the issues that we'll hear about from my co-panelists in just a minute. Certainly uh, could not have underscored the extent to which, um, or imagine, uh, the impact of COVID, and I was uh, very struck by some of the uh, observations of our panelists of of advancing uh, product development and outreach. Um, uh, you know, in eighteen in a month, uh, eighteen month time span, uh, in a very short uh, period of time, has certainly put a lot of things into to warp speed. Um, I would just note, um, uh, you know, in closing, there's one issue in the report uh, that I wanted to uh, to note, which and that. Uh, Harish touched upon in his slide presentation was um, that cross-sectoral data policies uh, that big tech companies uh, may be subject to can have implications for financial services. Um, these implications can be uh, uh, seen and felt in a number of different areas um, that uh, financial services policy regulators deal with uh, quite a bit, as well as the, the regulated community, uh, and that's in risk management and operational resilience, uh, regulatory information sharing, and also innovation. And so the report uh, notes that one of the policy implications is the growing importance of engagement between data experts and financial authorities so that data can be harnessed in a way that upholds public policy goals like data privacy and financial stability. Uh, in closing, I, I note this observation has been um, buttressed by uh, the October publication of uh, roadmap on on cross border payments. Um, one of the items in um, in the, uh, the the roadmap uh, sort of forecast that there'll be forthcoming engagement uh, between uh, uh, national and regional uh, data experts and financial services. Uh, and so that's one area that it'll be interesting to to see what transpires. Cheers, thank you, Liz, and. Uh... Congratulations on the new job, and you're quite right. 2017 seems a very it's a new long old time job. Ago. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 2017 seems a long time ago, and uh, both for COVID and Brexit. Um, right, uh, we're going to move next to John. 
uh, John Frost from the Bank uh, for International Settlements. Um, uh, Liz is uh, uh, very uh, kindly, John, referred to you as a fintech rock star, so you've got quite a billing to live up to. Um, John, give us your views on the opportunities of big tech uh, and your sense. Great, thanks. Uh, so, um, as Tom uh, and Elizabeth say, I'm uh, at the Bank for International Settlements and do research on innovation and the digital economy. I've also been involved uh, in this report and uh, this group for some time. Um, I, on the question of the, you know, the opportunities, I think that I just underscore one thing that was, um, you know, that Deviani and, and Paula and others got it back got it to some, which is that, um, you know, if, if you look at the actual, you know, opportunities for financial inclusion, um, I think that the report makes this case also that it's not theoretical. I mean, we've seen a lot of progress already from big techs in the, in the realm of financial inclusion. Uh, and PESA certainly uh, has helped to bring a lot of um, consumers into the financial system that weren't uh, weren't there previously. Um, likewise, uh, you know, Mercado Libre, uh, you know, what, uh, what Paolo was describing in Latin America, we see very tangible benefits. And certainly this is a policy area that um, policymakers have been working on for some time. You know, we've been doing a lot to try to enhance financial inclusion and big tech has certainly helped in, in that regard. And so I think that if we talk about the opportunities, um, you know, from, from a public policy perspective, we, we have to be very open that there is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of tangible progress um, that has been made. In terms of other policy implications, though, I mean, uh, certainly, um, you know, the report and, and as Sarish has discussed already, uh, it goes through the, the elements for competition, for financial stability. Um, you know, we're used to, as uh, people working on financial stability issues, worrying about uh, too big to fail systemic importance. And if you think about how big tech works, you know, that uh, very frequently you have products that have very low per user costs, but very high you know, fixed costs up front to develop products. I mean, it, it makes sense that it's, this is very beneficial in terms of bringing new users into the financial system. The cost per user is, is very low. By the same token, this lends itself just by, by nature uh, because of network effects, because of these high fixed costs to you know, dominant market positions. And so this is something that um, uh, you know, is, uh, relevant from a financial stability perspective and antitrust perspective. And I think then it's, um, it's quite right that uh, financial regulators are you know, considering these issues, trying to measure uh, the extent of you know, market shares in different markets, um, working on public infrastructures that should you know, ensure a level playing field, and also cooperating closely with, uh, with other authorities like data protection authorities and competition authorities. So this is, uh, to some extent, the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, again, very big benefits, and we've talked about a lot of them. Financial inclusion being uh, being key, but uh, among the you know the issues and risks, uh, specifically for financial stability, which is you know, the, the mandate of the FSB and, and its members, uh, this issue of, um, of dominance of the market and of you know, uh, concentration in the market and its uh, potential uh, systemic implications, I think, is key and this is one reason that financial regulators have to work with other authorities on and where the big tech firms themselves, I think, should also be quite open that this is an issue that um, regulators should do worry about. Thank you, John. Competition of structure, uh, clearly a huge, a huge topic, uh, which is well beyond just regulators and central banks, which is with a, a whole range of public policy bodies. Um, so we're going to turn now to, to Dirk, to Luxembourg. Um, Dirk, give us your Take on, on these issues around opportunities uh, uh, and policy implications. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Dirk Titscher, I hold the other chair in financial law and inclusive finance at the University of Luxembourg, and I'm heading the Center for Sustainable Governance and Markets also at the University of Luxembourg. Um, let me first congratulate um, the FSB team for focusing on this very important topic. After all, we're speaking about more than 80% of the world's population, uh, where more than a billion people are still unbanked, even if you have made fantastic progress over the last decade. Um, examining how we can further financial inclusion while enhancing, maintaining, increasing financial stability and consumer protection is, of course, of paramount importance. So, what are the opportunities? John has already pointed out financial inclusion. Maybe we should stress it, it is not just getting people who, are, who have been previously been unbanked into the banking system. It's also new ways to end customers. So the traditional 
providers are simply not bridging the last mile. And here, of course, technology can be helpful via the internet, satellite, or whatever, mobile phone networks. Then, but it's also the range of services that have increased. It's, it's not just a, a bank account. It is definitely um, a banking plus with uh, knowledge transfer, with all kinds of advice coming with it. And that should not be estimated for populations that usually score low on the financial literacy. Um, let me put out what this knowledge transfer means in detail. On the one hand, of course, there's a huge knowledge transfer from big tech to regulators. Maybe the regulators don't get all of the picture, but at least they learn a lot about technology and technology business models when they, they work with big techs entering into the market. But there's also a huge knowledge transfer when it comes to retail customers. And uh, of course, also the wholesale market benefits a lot from uh, this knowledge transfer because new product also means that uh, there's an advancement on the side of, of the users. But I would also stress a third type of knowledge transfer from big tech to the people because there will be service stuff, enhancement of infrastructure, a lot of these uh, benefits of, which stay in society even if big, big tech services will stop. And all of that leads um, the emerging economies, the developing countries uh, into a leapfrogging stage. They jump over development stages that have uh, been uh, endured for years elsewhere. They can avoid the mistakes and of course uh, they can use corrective measures developed elsewhere and learn. Yeah? So let's say regulatory technology, the topic of yesterday is here a big word that uh, can also be used. Of course, nothing is without risks. And I want to emphasize five types of risks. On the risk of regulatory capture. A very big firm usually comes with a lot of resources and it's just all, co all too convenient from the side of regulators uh, to follow the lead, usually provided with very big law firm uh, uh, blueprints or whatever. And of course, that can lead to a bit one-sided view on the big tech activity. John has already pointed out financial stability. Maybe I want to stress that point in one particular dimension because usually what big tech leads to is eventually kind of platform building. That is also mentioned in the report, but what is not so clearly pointed out in the report is how to regulate platforms because it's extremely difficult. And here's why. We want to retain the benefits and that means many people need to use the platform to make this worthwhile. But on the other hand, we want to mitigate the risk. And that means we want the people to be less dependent on the platform. And this is a paradox in which uh, regulators will struggle to deal with. Yeah? So they have to, I, I like this word, they have to shower with big tech without getting wet. Yeah? So that's a bit of a challenge here. Um, I think a third challenge that comes with the entrance of big tech is the regulatory mission. We heard that already that there's antitrust and market structure concerns and often it is said that is beyond the scope of regulators and supervisory agencies, central banks. I'm not sure about that. When you start thinking about it, if there is lesser competition, there will be lesser innovation, there will be, of course, lesser means to manage risks coming from the technology. So I think regulators should reconsider the mandate in the sense that furthering innovation, but also antitrust concerns can be part of their financial stability paradigm when dealing with big tech. Fourth, local sovereignty issues. We will have a dependency on big tech if, for instance, a big tech driven financial institution is the sole access provider or almost dominant access provider. And finally, I think we have sometimes challenges to provide locally optimal solutions because the solution developed elsewhere is maybe not the best for that specific market with a specific financial literacy level. And that, of course, means that the local authorities need to withstand the pressure to standardize along IT rules rather than what is beneficial for the local market. I hand back to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, hugely helpful. Um, I think I strongly agree with uh, is this uh, concept of leapfrogging. Uh, and, and really, just uh, for, for those of us in, in more advanced economies, uh, remembering that the amount for us to learn uh, from emerging market and developing economies, uh, who in many senses are setting the pace in driving innovation uh, in fintech. So our next uh, question uh, is going to cover the positive role, hopefully, that policy can play in supporting safe innovation uh, and achieving some of the benefits that Dirk outlined. And um, perhaps I'll go uh, first to John. Um, John, what's your view on the, the role that policy can play to support positive and safe innovation? 
Yeah, so this is something we've discussed a lot, and and for those um, you know, who uh, have seen the report and, and looked there, um, there's a lot of discussion of public infrastructure. So I thought maybe I would just talk a little bit about you know what this has looked like in practice. And this comes back to um, so far we're investing in this fashion. So policy can can do a lot in terms of you know creating a level playing field, creating the supporting infrastructure that allows um, big tech and other financial services to thrive. And one example you know that we heard about a little bit is the India stack. So here you have a digital identity, which is provided by the government. You have uh, the unified payments interface, which you know is owned in this case by the, the banks, but uh, with a role by the RBI. And you have um, you know these uh, these uh, standards that allow uh, for payment services and, and other financial services to be built on top of the solid foundation and allow for a competitive level playing field. And this is something that's um, you know, what's really interesting about the India stack is that uh, to some extent there's a symbiosis here. There's a role for both the public and private sector to um, to contribute. And we've seen, you know, as, as Alyssa was discussing with, uh, with Google Pay, um, certainly Google Pay has uh, thrived on, on the back of, you know, the UPI and, uh, and Adhar, but uh, Adhar and, uh, and UPI have also benefited from, uh, from the strong demand that, uh, that comes from these big tech services. And there are other examples in many other emerging market developing economies. So in those cases, you know, the, the public sector is really providing a platform. Um, you know, this, this helps to, these infrastructures help to create a level playing field and allow for competitive services between different providers. And that's a good example of how the public and private sector can, can play their role. In terms of other policies, I mean, uh, we've discussed regulation and that it's, you know, as Dirk mentioned, it is very difficult. There are a lot of elements of regulation. And I think that a lot of big tech firms that are entering uh, financial services uh, come into contact with the fact that there are a lot of authorities even just amongst the financial regulators there are a lot of us around um, sometimes an alphabet soup of authorities to, to deal with and uh, certainly a, a variety of policy goals everything from aml cft to you know prudential regulation macro prudential regulation all of these things but there's a clear reason why all of these frameworks are in place um, i mean basically these are each tailored to a certain societal wrong societal harm things that have gone wrong in the past that we want to prevent from happening again in the future. And it's very important to apply those regulations. And I would just make the point, um, you know, in terms of what policy can do, I think the biggest barrier to responsible innovation isn't necessarily policy or regulation. The biggest barrier to responsible innovation taking off is when things go really wrong. So we see that, you know, a, a big tech provider um, you know, would fail or would uh, would harm consumers in a way that's, uh, that's really, you know, um, creates a lot of societal outcry. This is the sort of thing that then leads to a regulatory response. But in addition to that, you know, undermines trust in the services and might uh, might actually hamper adoption of beneficial innovations. So I think that to the private sector firms and, and to the authorities uh, that are thinking about how to deal with this, uh, the issue isn't uh, necessarily, you know, uh, that regulations are standing in the way of innovation. I think that there are cases where, where a lack of regulation uh, and you know, turning a blind eye to some of these risks could in the end be much more harmful to the development of the sector. Okay, I'll uh, I'll stop myself there. Thank you, John. That's uh, that's really helpful. I was uh, talking to a colleague in the Bank of England who uh, described themselves uh, as a historian of regulation, uh, and they said that uh, they they saw a repeating uh, and long-standing history where uh, risks crystallise, cause harms for society, and then the outcry drives regulation. And that they were hopeful that with technology. Uh, and fintech, we'd be able to break that cycle and perhaps have the regulation in place in a positive way to help uh, sustain uh, rather than wait for things to go wrong and then retrospectively put regulation in place. Uh, we'll see whether that uh, proves to be true. Um, perhaps, Dirk, I'll go to you next. Um, what, what's your view on the positive role of policy and, and, and any advice you'd give to policymakers as they start to think about these topics? Yeah, thank you, Tom. I mean, of course, um, the crash then law cycle usually leads to bad regulation because crises make bad law. And in this regard, I encourage uh, to take a proactive approach when it comes to innovation. So um, as a first piece of advice that we have identified in research, also with a number of surveys with regulators, is that um, the regulator must understand its mandate to go beyond risk control and to see innovation as one part of long-term risk control, yeah, which is uh, what I just pointed out. So understanding the mandate then means they have a number of regulatory tools at hand. Um, for instance, they can 
simply start abolishing unsuitable regulation. You know? Then they can uh, try to get proportionate regulation. That means smaller firms will be subject to less burdensome rules than the larger ones. Um, then, of course, they can engage in communication in a structured way through innovation hubs. And um, we've seen very successful testing and piloting schemes. Uh, so, for instance, by just defining what a regulatory definition, uh, what a regulatory activity is, you can already engage in testing and piloting. And then you can get into a kind of structured testing and piloting in a regulatory sandbox. Then uh, we have the opportunity to get into restricted licenses where only part of the activity is licensed. And uh, then we have, of course, waivers and no action letters program. So there's a huge, uh, huge toolbox that regulators uh, can use. The important part is that regulators need to get into the nasty details of technology. So they, I, I spoke once to the CEO of a, of a very successful regulator in the field of innovation, and he tells me that every Friday he goes to one of these innovation hubs and looks at uh, the CEO of this authority and, and looks at the presentation of the new uh, fintech and regtech firms presenting their own ideas. And then he gets back into the authority and um, try to implement uh, the knowledge uh, into a policy scheme. And I think this kind of curiosity for technology is really, really crucial when, as a regulator, you're facing this. Um, as maybe one more element that I want to introduce, because it is not so widely discussed in the literature, uh, that is localization requirements. Localization requirements are a two-sided sword. On the one hand, they enhance cost and can uh, reduce service quality, in particular when you need very big data pools by segregating these data pools nationally, you maybe reduce the data necessary for good decisions. On the other hand, think about localization requirements maybe as one type of resilience, because uh, resilience schemes, because when you have a globally active entity and the issue stems from something outside of your own uh, uh, jurisdiction, then it's extremely difficult to maintain operations if the data are not in your jurisdiction and if there's no one able to handle the data. So maybe here a kind of uh, uh, soft localization requirement that there's one mirror copy of data in your jurisdiction and then there's a team for minimum maintenance and, and risk management from IT perspective to manage the tech risk. That could also be something uh, to, to kind of balance things. So being curious, but also with the Zentry uh, with the guards at the door. Yeah, this is a kind of balance that I would strongly uh, advise for regulators. Thank you, Dirk. Um, curiosity is uh, is a perfect word, I think, to describe the right mindset uh, for both mm -hmm. policymakers and for supervisors. Uh, a hugely important quality to have uh, the ability uh, and mindset to be curious. Uh, like, uh, clearly, uh, a huge topic uh, in finance, um, not just in uh, technology and fintech. Um, I think the importance of uh, forums like the FSB is uh, to bring international collaboration to hopefully uh, keep uh, our financial system, our global financial system, uh, open uh, and safe and free from, from frictions. Uh, but of course, we also have to uh, be very clear that we have to protect uh, the interests and the well-being of our, of our users uh, in our home countries, of the uh, integrity of the financial systems in our home countries, uh, and clearly striking that balance between uh, an open uh, and resilient global financial system uh, and the, the due protection of, of users of finance is a really uh, important topic. Um, Liz, uh, you've uh, uh, back at the SEC have worked um, uh, and have a, a really sort of privileged view across uh, policy and, and finance. Uh, what's your sort of uh, sense of how we can use policy positively to, to shape innovation? Um, thanks, and um, really sort of had two observations, uh, reactions to uh, the remarks from my, my co-panelists. Um, and, and this sort of also leads into sort of opportunities in the FinTech area. Um, and this has to deal with uh, public-private uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, I was struck in particular yesterday, one of the uh, panelists uh, described the uh, the, you know, the, the, the feeling after uh, the 2008 financial crisis uh, that it was more uh, sort of a top-down implementation and regulatory uh, response. Um, and so the, the sort of the, the cycles of crisis and response that, that Dirk and uh, John both noted, um, it, it raised the question, at least I think this, this one other panelist felt like the context for FinTech uh, was uh, a bit different. 
um, that I think when you look at the combination of panelists yesterday and then the presentations that we uh, heard on the, the private uh, sector side this morning that um, this type of uh, collaboration uh, is going to be critical to deriving uh, the benefits uh, from fintech. Um, uh, when Dirk sort of talks about uh, uh, regulators' interest in uh, mind melding uh, with with fintech uh, innovators, uh, I think that may be one thing in this sphere that is different and provides opportunities. Uh, on all sides, uh, and that uh, private sector, public sector partnerships um, uh, it can have been and can be a, a key tool uh, in supporting uh, financial innovation. Um, the other point I would make also goes to um, some of the observations from uh, from yesterday. Uh, for for those who may not have had the chance to see the partner presentation on uh, big tech and uh, and soup tech. Um, and I think it also goes to, um, uh, you know, being optimistic about what technology can do, but also being uh, realistic um, that uh, there are some some sort of core key principles um, that would drive regulatory uh, consideration. Um, I think particularly the pace of innovation uh, creates a, a challenge in both it advanced and emerging markets, and, and this may go to the, the leapfrogging concept that was mentioned, um, and where feasible uh, regulators should try to, to aim to future-proof uh, regulation, uh, perhaps by not necessarily getting um, uh, locked into particular uh, avenues. Um, I know from a uh, U.S. perspective, um, that there is a keen interest in fostering an ecosystem that that welcomes innovation, um, and that means about constant balancing of the the risks posed by uh, new technology uh, with the um, the innovation. Um, some of the the key things um, and policies objectives are avoiding uh, uh, regulatory arbitrage, and we've heard mentioned uh, trying to create a. Um, uh, a level playing field, um, and I think uh, also harking back to some of the observations about the impact of uh, COVID, um, I think it's really you know highlighted how financial innovation in both advanced and emerging markets um, uh, is important uh, lever to to help mitigate uh, mitigate the impacts uh, of the crisis. Uh, and so I think you know basically sticking with some of the basics and first. Uh, principles is a good point of uh, departure uh, for regulators to have in mind uh, in, in addressing this area. Cheers, thank you, Liz. Uh, seeing the positives uh, for fintech as as something that can help us respond to challenge of COVID and hopefully have a prosperous recovery is really important. I think you also now hold the prize for the first use of the world uh, mind meld in an FSB meeting, um, not one I've heard before, so it's a good one. Um, right, the final question is about the role of international collaboration in this area. Um, Dirk, uh, why don't you have the first go uh, and then I'll turn to Liz and then to John. Um, international collaborations help us get the positives of big tech innovation. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, on the one hand, of course, um, the FSB uh, uh, can function as a very valuable forum for knowledge exchange, uh, for exchanging supervisory experience. But I also think it can take a coordinating role when it comes to ensuring supervisory convergence. In particular, uh, tech-related standards and rules usually require some balancing, whether um, a certain activity is similar in function to something that's already regulated and here uh, putting a lot of supervisory experience together and discussing certain business models regardless of whether they're apparently market and platform based or um, intermediary based that could probably um, have some valuable contribution when it comes to rule making across the globe then i think another aspect that is related to that is um, discussing the scope of supervision uh, we see more and more services getting out of scope of traditional financial supervision, um, but then there's a new concentration somewhere else. So let's take, for instance, when we speak about decentralized finance, blockchain-based finance, then often we see 
a new concentration on the side of cloud service providers, maybe on the side of uh, certain IE, uh, um, artificial intelligence vendors and so on, and discussing what type of activities shall be regulated for which purpose. I think this is something where the FSB can really take a crucial role. Um, I think one more aspect is ensuring that we get a college approach for truly global actors, because the college approach is necessary when we look at financial conglomerates, which have different licenses in different parts of the world. And here, when it comes to college building, a supervisory college, I think, is the only way to avoid regulatory arbitrage across the globe. Very often, competing jurisdictions kind of have to look at uh, one entity and see what global risks come from there. And when you only get to other types of uh, supervisory cooperation, in particular through MOUs, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, usually those MOUs are difficult to handle in practice and insufficient to deal with regulatory arbitrage. So maybe if we can find a FSB-driven college approach to tech-driven financial conglomerates, that could have really a, a, a salient effect on, on, on supervision of these truly global actors, because then supervision is globally organized as are the actors. And of course, that requires a lot of talking because we all know that everyone wants to have the lead when they think they're important. And because usually a big country to believe they're important, that means there's a lot of challenges and uh, uh, discussions. And I wish the FSB good luck to moderate this discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Dirk. I suspect we might need it. Um, interesting question about the scope of supervision, which obviously uh, relates to uh, the regulatory perimeter, both uh, for financial and non-financial activities. Uh, and also uh, the very important role of service providers, um, which is uh, something the FSB has done a, a, a quite years. Um, so, Liz, uh, speaking from the SEC, which is uh, hugely internationally influential and, and active, uh, what's your role uh, view on the role of international collaboration? Um, I think uh, uh, certainly it is critical um, when you look at the potential for um, uh, scalability in a number of different types of uh, fintech uh, innovations, whether it's in the uh, banking sector, market sector, uh, or, or even um, insurance. Um, one thing that, uh, example that came um, uh, to mind, um, and this is probably uh, collaboration more in uh, what you might call the micro prudential uh, space uh, is the uh, number of market regulators, including those in the US uh, are members of this, uh, the global financial innovation uh, network. Um, uh, uh, GFIN, I think is the uh, acronym. Uh, and uh, Tom, I believe you've your counterparts at the uh, FCA play uh, a big role in this. And um, I also think that some of the uh, multilateral organizations uh, represented uh, uh, here as part of the discussion, uh, the IMF and the World Bank um, act as observers. Um, and they've, uh, you know, have uh, taken uh, to heart um, uh, trying to uh, improve more efficient ways for innovative firms to interact with regulators, um, and in particular, um, navigating between uh, countries. And so um, they've uh, got this uh, network uh, developed to share different experiences um, uh, and approaches. Um, I would uh, commend for folks to look at a report that uh, they did this year uh, where they reflected on some cross-border uh, testing um, uh, pilot uh, arrangements and um, uh, how they're trying to uh, calibrate it so that uh, they can more effectively um, uh, foster communication about um, what the nature of their pilot is, um, setting forth a, a one place where folks might be able to identify the types of activity that regulators uh, can support. This this goes to, I think, both your and um, uh, Dirk's uh, comments about, uh, you know, looking at the perimeter uh, because it can have different uh, context and contours in, in different jurisdictions. Um, and looking, uh, I think the report noted also streamlining sort of uh, uh, entry forms for um, uh, financial um, uh, innovators. 
so I think the the good news is is this I think helps to illustrate that those conversations uh, are taking place, um, and uh, that you know the regulatory community strongly supports uh, international collaboration uh, as a way to address some of the um, uh, the issues and challenges identified in the report. Thanks, Liz, and that's uh, that's absolutely spot on. The uh, the international regulatory community really do support. Um, both international collaboration, but also engagement with innovators. And uh, like you, I'd really commend uh, the, the GFIN work as something which people should pay very close attention to, because I think it's a great initiative. And that's not just because of the involvement of the FCA, uh, although their leadership uh, has been fantastic in that area, but it's a truly global effort. Um, the final word, and perhaps John could uh, be relatively brief, uh, so we can leave plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, John, uh, Sitting in the BIS, you obviously have a huge view over uh, fintech in all sorts of different countries. Uh, how can we use collaboration, do you think, to, to help support innovators? Yeah, so <clears throat> I agree with what, uh, what Elizabeth and, and Derek have said just now, and I thought maybe I would just take it one step further and be a little bit more concrete with what collaboration actually has done in practice. And I think there are a lot of cases where regulators are dealing with you know, big tech entry into financial services brings opportunities and risks. Uh, a lot of time there's there's uncertainty about how to deal with it exactly. And you know we've seen concrete examples where authorities have said that it's really useful to hear from other authorities who you know perhaps further along on this who've seen big tech entry in payments or in credit or in insurance already, and actually being able to learn from their experience being able to see what regulations were used, whether things worked, you know, whether things um, have been successful or what could have been done differently. And very frequently, you know, regulators in Latin America say very explicitly they're interested in the experience from you know, their, their colleagues in Asia. Um, similarly, as, as Tom mentioned, you know, a lot of authorities in advanced economies are very interested in, in what's being done in emerging markets, and, uh, particularly those uh, those places where mobile money or, you know, big tech, uh, platforms have, uh, have already um, you know, achieved a higher penetration. You know, what can you actually, um, what are the policy uh, tools that have been used elsewhere? How do you monitor things? You know, can you use powers uh, for data collection, for instance, based on uh, activities on being systemically important? And how do you tell if they're systemically important if you don't have the powers of data collection? So some of these very concrete things are, are areas where re regulators can really learn from one another. And having groups like the FSB, which is of course global, but also its regional consultative groups, which extend the membership or the reach of the FSB even beyond its you know core um, G20 plus members, uh, that's that's really useful. I would just close though with one further aspect to this, which is I mentioned up front that um, big tech touches on you know data protection issues and antitrust issues, and there are authorities who are responsible for data protection and antitrust, and not just in the financial sector. And there is still a need for further dialogue, not only between the financial regulators and ministries, as you know, are represented on the FSB and its groups, but also with these uh, competition authorities and data protection authorities. And uh, this is still an area of active work, but uh, but just for the benefit of all of those here, I think that this is an area where uh, the public and private sector probably have a joint interest in uh, in the authorities talking to one another and, and being sure that uh, the policy is being enacted for the financial sector and also for the other sectors. Uh, and uh, aim to uh, adequately support innovation and address the risks. John, I uh, um, hugely agree on the need for um, a broad dialogue with a wide range of authorities. Um, these are really big topics around data competition that we need to have a very uh, positive uh, dialogue with those stakeholders on. Uh, central banks, regulators can't do it all on our own. Uh, and we need to be very open to those dialogues. Uh, and secondly, uh, again, to really endorse the role the financial stability boards, regional groups, which are hugely important. Um, so massive thanks to uh, to Liz, uh, to Dirk, uh, and to John. Uh, now is the opportunity for for questions uh, from the uh, from the audience, uh, for which I'll hand over to Colin, who's going to facilitate that for us. Colin, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, also, thank you to, to John, on this and and Dirk on the very uh, insightful comments and and uh, uh, share with us. Well, um, uh, thanks to the secretariat, uh, they've collected uh, the questions and uh, uh, we've basically got a handful of it. Um, from the questions received, it appears to me that there has been, you know, uh, intense interest probably among the 
regulatory colleagues here about in practice how to you know implement the same risk same regulation you know uh, 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 principle given the the specific nature of this you know big tech company um, for example they are usually cross border in nature uh, some mentioned about digital multinationals and which can contribute to you know uh, legal issues uh, competition issues and not to mention the data privacy ones and as well uh, these big techs are usually uh, highly tech savvy and very complex technologically. And so um, uh, there, there is a worry about whether the regulators, especially the emerging market, would have the resources um, to effectively supervise them. And uh, so there, there is a, a suggestion or a question about whether we actually need to have some sort of, you know, common standards uh, that would be helpful as guidance to uh, to accept, for example, the regulators in the uh, emerging markets to help them with the, you know, uh, uh, regulation of these, you know, big tech activities. And uh, for this, uh, I would suggest that um, uh, for the first one, uh, uh, perhaps I can start off by asking John about uh, uh, your your views or your experience uh, on on how how can regulators gear up in terms of the resources in dealing with uh, the regulation of you know these big tech you know financial activities and uh, in terms of the support to the you know emerging markets uh, what can you know uh, international organization like BIS can do to help out can I uh, first pose the qu first question to you John sure absolutely Colin Yes, so certainly there is a capacity issue. Um, a number of authorities have said that uh, they find it difficult sometimes to monitor these new activities. Very frequently, new activities build on you know, uh, the use of big data and new technologies. So you need to have a certain amount of technological expertise to understand uh, both the opportunities and the risks and uh, to formulate policy effectively. And so certainly there is a need for capacity building, uh, not only in emerging market developing economies, but I would add also in advanced economy uh, regulatory authorities. Uh, there's a need to catch up and to understand uh, what, what's going on in the sector and to um, be able to uh, regulate effectively. So, you know, taking part in international dialogues like this one is, is one means, of course, of getting up to speed. And, uh, and some regulators have gone through a trial by fire. They've, you know, had to very quickly um, build the capacity because they've had to deal with concrete cases. But there are also opportunities for a more you know, proactive approach, uh, particularly for you know, newer staff and when there's uh, you know, time to do this. So the BIS, for instance, um, has a lot of work through the Financial Stability Institute, the FSI. Uh, this has worked on, on capacity building. I know yesterday in the context of the RegTech and SoupTech discussion, uh, there was um, mention of this. There are also um, you know, training courses out there that are aimed at uh, authorities and that can help uh, to enhance skill sets and build capacity. One that I would just call out in particular is the uh, Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance and the Financial Technology and Regulatory Innovation course, which is a great uh, resource for regulators and staff to, uh, to build up their skills and understand both the technologies and the you know, economics of fintech. And I think that the World Bank and the IMF, you know, through their technical assistance, also do quite good work on this. But again, there is an area where um, everyone's catching up. Uh, even the the trainers need to uh, first get up to speed so they can train authorities effectively. And um, I think that there is, you know, perhaps in more ways than in other areas, a, a two-way um, dialogue and two-way learning uh, occurring here, as both um, you know, those who are actually regulating and, and those who Coordinating the international discussions, uh, learn together about uh, how to, uh, to deal with risks and how to actively uh, uh, formulate policy. Thank you, John. I think so, certainly, I think certainly, uh, international organization like BIS, uh, FSB, certainly can continue pay, to play a very important role in this. And uh, uh, well, uh, after all, I think the big tech is kind of a new species that we really haven't, you know, experienced before. And uh, uh, they kind of, you know, having some some sort of touches on our, you know, uh, traditional regulatory space, but still, uh, they they do have some sort of, you know, uh, areas that actually go beyond us, uh, in terms of, you know, security regulations, in terms of, you know, uh, banking regulations, 
and uh, and so they they probably uh, certainly a lot uh, to, to to collaborate and to discuss, and uh, we we need to gear up, you know, in terms of our own capability as well, no doubt. And next, um, I think in terms of of the capacity or in, ter or in terms of the complexity of you know uh, uh, dealing with you know uh, cross border uh, big tech. I think that there is certainly a legal aspect to it. Uh, can I uh, ask uh, Dirk to share with us uh, what are the most commonly seen, you know, legal issues involved in, you know, uh, tackling, you know, uh, big tech with cross-border, you know, uh, kind of, you know, activities? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, with the permission of the organizers, I will just share a link to a report uh, how capacity building can take place in addition to what John has done. If that's okay uh, for you, then I will do it. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank good. you. Dirk, just to flag you on mute at your end. I'm sorry. So, um, the uh, the main legal issue I'm aware of is usually where the headquarter of the activity is. In particular, when we have strongly tech-based services, uh, we may not have in each country where there's a service also uh, a, a full organization. And uh, we all know that in financial regulation, the headquarter requirement uh, is extremely essential uh, to enable crisis management. The second aspect I'm aware of is cross-border activity when it comes to mutual recognition schemes or equivalents or um, uh, substituted compliance is all the same. Um, we have regional approaches. Meanwhile, in Asia, we have that, of course, in Europe, very successfully so. And um, that usually requires two things, trust on the side of the cooperating regulators and some minimum legal harmonization, because in a divergent legal setting, um, mutual trust cannot be created. So that is usually something that takes years and years and years to build. Then from a private law perspective, what we often see is um, standing to sue issues, liability issues, when there are disappointed um, or maybe defrauded uh, um, investors. For instance, we have seen schemes where um, where, where the funds that should be channeled in payment schemes have disappeared. We saw that in certain countries in Africa, but we also saw it in a German firm we all know of. And so these kind of schemes require supervisory cooperation to kind of retain the trust in the financial system, because when a fairly large financial conglomerate fails, uh, then uh, that puts a lot of pressure on the authorities in charge. We all know that there will always be fraudster and crim criminals. That's something that comes with the opportunity to make money. Uh, but here, I think the legal issue is, can we really cooperate? Can we exchange personal data? Can we go after criminals together? Uh, because very often we, we, we have privacy rules. We have also limitations of jurisdiction and so on, and not really full cooperation. Uh, and here, I think it's really, really important to have the atmosphere in the supervisory schemes uh, in, in the co cooperation that we really hunt down the bad guys because there are too many of them, unfortunately. But this sounds like to me, it, it, it's, it's not really long, unlike what we have today in terms of the home host, you know, supervision for financial institution. It's just that we may need to, to, to do something specific about, you know, big tech. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, um, the problems that we had in the past, let's say uh, 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 the evil guy calling up someone by phone is now facilitated because that same evil guy can contact millions at the same time by uh, by technology. Yeah? So uh, the victims are many more and so is uh, the potential amount that is defrauded and stolen. And of course, we all know uh, that an algorithm is very hard to understand. We don't know how this technology works. Maybe, in fact, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, piling up commission by the thousands by having millions of clients. So the scale, the level, the volume is much more, the speed is faster, and that requires, and on the side of the supervisors, uh, uh, sophisticated regulatory technologies to find out what type of uh, things are facilitated by technology. So it's a kind of arms race here. And, and this arms race, we all know when the fraudsters uh, have the latest technology, then there's a need also on the enforcement authorities to, to come after them. Yeah? The other thing is financial stability. Of course, there is a lot of technology risk in all of that. Yeah? We, we trust the algorithms, but we all know they will fail either because they don't have the data or they're not well programmed. 
no algorithm is perfect. I had to program for four years algorithms. I can tell you that usually uh, my, my programmers uh, at five o'clock in the evening were in a good mood and at six o'clock in the morning they were sweaty and they still told me we have no problem. Yeah? So that's a bit of a something that you only have, a, you find the problem when you see it. And that's maybe too late if a full financial system relies on it. So apportioning the risk, risk mitigation, diversification, all the traditional uh, rules also apply to the technology world. You just need to be aware of it, that the computer is not bulletproof and not without failure. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you that we actually need uh, additional tools or new tools to deal with this new, you know, new risk. But having said that, I, I, I do think that, um, uh, for, for most of the, I, I think, big tech, uh, especially for, for our distinguished guests, you know, today, uh, uh, they are actually doing quite well in terms of, you know, uh, uh, handling risk and, and dealing with the customers, you know. Uh, well, next, uh, I, I would like to, to, to turn to Liz uh, about, uh, earlier on I mentioned about their the question on whether we actually need common standards across, you know, different jurisdictions. Uh, when when tackling the risk, you know, uh, caused by you know big big tech company, I I, I think you mentioned that actually, um, uh, when when dealing with this sort of you know uh, activities, we can look at it microscopically, in terms of the individual kind of activities, and there can also be a, a macro perspective, to you know managing you know big tech you know activities as a whole. Um, Back in Hong Kong, we, 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 we practice a principle, what we call the risk-based technology neutral, you know, principle in dealing with fintech activities, meaning that we actually look at the intrinsic value or intrinsic risk inherent in the fintech activities. So we try to tackle the, the risk with the same kind of standard that we applied to the same activities conducted by other, you know, types of financial institutions. So from this perspective, uh, that seems to suggest that uh, perhaps we should, or there may not be a very strong case for, for common standard. But uh, if you look at it from a, from a macro perspective, I think um, uh, Big Tech themselves, when they you know, do gain a very large scale, they do can have you know, potentially a systemic impact on the market as a whole. From that perspective, there might be sort of a, 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 a need for, for something like what we call resolution regime for them. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Liz, do you have any views on, on whether we, we, we can do it uh, 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 on an individual activity basis or actually we need some sort of, sort of common standards uh, over, over Big Tech for the sake of them being, being a Big Tech company? Um, let me... Uh... I will tackle that one. I do want to tackle on one observation to Dirk's prior uh, uh, comments, if if I may, um, which is about uh, you know underpinning legal structures and sort of public interest in um, work on combating what are um, you know old school techniques in terms of fraud and um, promoting investor protection and and um, uh, note that. Uh, in particular, the IOSCO, the International Organization of Securities Commissions, has uh, created a, um, a, a wonderful umbrella buttressed by uh, legal authority and in individual countries to support uh, regulatory uh, cooperation. So I wanted to um, just use the opportunity to, uh, to plug that effort. Um, I, I won't even begin on resolution type issues is outside of my um, uh, frame of, of reference. Um, I think with respect to, you know, common standards there, those have been established for the most part as, as the FSB is, you know, is well aware in different um, uh, sectors between, um, you know, banking, securities um, uh, and insurance. Um, and then there's, you know, uh, application that happens at different countries levels, but the objective is, uh, to try have a, a common frame of, of reference. Uh, for, uh, compliance with, um, uh, those standards, uh, I think what we have seen, uh, because of the, um, potential for, you know, disintermediation and the. 
um, uh, specific types of applications that may be used in big tech is uh, there is a greater premium on uh, collaboration between you know sectors uh, as well as uh, across um, uh, borders. Um, but at you know the national level, it will be looking at what your uh, toolkit is, what your laws are, and then this concept of uh, keeping an eye on the uh, perimeter um, and uh, uh, you know assessing you know if there are gaps identified, um, uh, what may need to be done to uh, address them, and uh, there are ways within the um, you know international standard sector bodies for those issues to be. Uh, fleshed up and considered and, and, you know, done with with public um, uh, input. Uh, so I think the 1st thing is, you know, to identify, you know, would there be gaps that need to be addressed that way? Um, and uh, that's that's sort of, uh, I'd say, everyday blocking and tackling um, uh, with the FSB and its its members. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, certainly, I think uh, I believe that for in, in most of the you know markets, we already have some tools uh, here and there to to deal with the you know uh, big tech activities. And uh, uh, certainly, I think uh, over time we will see whether any type of new risk that are right now not adequately being covered would need to be you know taken care of. Um, well, next, uh, I'd like to to. Uh, ask our you know private sector uh, participant. Um, uh, for example, I think uh, I can pose my first question to to Elisa about about um, uh, in in terms of your activities. I think in 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 vast different markets, um, what would be the the kind of you know uh, economies of scale that that you you are actually seeing uh, in terms of uh, of other than uh, a particular, you know, company, uh, would there be uh, other kind of, you know, uh, uh, market participant that you can, you know, sort of stimulate or promote uh, so that um, they could have a kind of, a, you know, a better competition within the, the market segment that you are serving? Or, or put it uh, more, more, more in another way? Um, uh, what would be the you know uh, market stimulating effects uh, that uh, you you have seen in terms of the market that you are active in that you can actually bring about new new new, new payers coming into the market? So sorry, when you say market stimulating effects, as in features of markets which enable competition and innovation. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I yeah right. Sure. So I think that um, so if we take India as an example, um, we saw that one of the key reasons for there being so much uh, innovation and competition in that market, not just from banks and traditional financial services players, but also from new tech players, is the fact that the, the real time payment system UPI enables third party participation um, in the market. So we as, as one of the sort of key features of a real time payments that we really encourage when we talk to different um, regulators around the world. Third party participation, we do think is really key because then that will enable a much broader range of participants um, in financial services, not just the traditional players like banks. It will enable all sorts of fintech players. So whether it's players like us, GPay, or other lots of other different types of um, providers. So I think that is a really key area. Um, and we can actually see that in one of the projects that we're involved with now, um, which is the Moja Loop um, initiative. So um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with this, but Moja Loop is essentially open source software that enables real time payments. It was initially developed by the Gates Foundation, um, but they have now created the Moja Loop Foundation, which we sit on the board on um, with a few other players, including Amidia, Ripple. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation um, and Modus Box. And that's really looking at scaling um, that type of real-time payments infrastructure, which, which we saw in India to great success in other markets. And one of the key 
parts of Boja Loop um, that we are really advocating for is this third party participation. So hopefully, um, as more countries look at adopting that type of model, that will um, foster uh, greater innovation from lots of different types of players. Actually, there will be, for example, like downstream or upstream, you know, service provider that will be benefit by this sort of, you know, uh, new, you know, big tech activities, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I'm not sure whether whether uh, 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 Paula is, 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 all, is also seeing such a trend in terms of, you know, big tech activities bringing, you know, uh, new business opportunity or new activity to, to the market so that that will have an, you know, beneficial effect in terms of, you know, stimulating innovations and adding new payers to the market. Colin, I'm sorry, I don't think we have Paula on. <laughs> yes. Well, um, in that case, I, I think uh, I probably have uh, run out of all the questions that I've got. Um, uh, in that case, perhaps uh, we can end this Q&A section a, a little bit earlier. Colin, maybe maybe the one question that that I saw is the transfer from cash. Maybe that's an interesting aspect. I probably have visit. Ah, there was this, yeah. How how we can transfer from cash to digital right now in COVID times? That's of course a very very big issue in emerging markets, uh, which. Uh, I think this is really where digitalization can play its full force. And there we have to think about digital client onboarding. Uh, because uh, client onboarding so far is very physical because of AML rules. And here, maybe the FSAB can also uh, take on um, some coordinating work. There are some approaches from Mexico and other, um, other uh, initiatives, also from FFATF and so on. Because when we get the client onboarding done, then we can turn the cash society into a digital cashless society. But of course, only if there's a resilience of the digital financial system. Yeah. Uh, Colin, can you allow me just to comment on this? This is Ahmed. And I think this is a very important uh, point, which is the EQIC, uh, the digital example here in Saudi. We have a very robust uh, system that, you know, we uh, gather the information from a company that is related to the uh, you know, as a, as a source of uh, data that is easy to register and do things digitally. And imagine if a company that started from zero uh, to reach to close to 4.5 million users in 18 months in a country that is, you know, talking about 30 uh, uh, million population with almost half of them below the age of uh, uh, 18 years old. So we're talking about 30. Uh, uh, you know, uh, good and robust technologies that is enabling us to do the AKYC. And I, I, uh, one of the biggest challenges, the moving people to cash is not just the digital AKYC, but the incentive to ask those guys to come and also use that service because building a trust, there is a very robust assist uh, banks and others uh, in place. So how can you let them move from one uh, provider to another provider, especially in countries where they are in a very good stage in, in terms of financial inclusion. I, I, I apologize. I think I have missed that, you know, uh, from cash to, to, digital, to digital questions. Well, on this, uh, no doubt that I think uh, after, after COVID, I mean, everybody is talking about how to, you know, migrate to, to digital currency or digital payment. And I think that's the reason why a lot of, you know, uh, authorities are right now looking at the potential for uh, digital CBDC. Um, about whether it can help to, you know, uh, change the landscape for payment, make it more digital so that there will be less physical contact. And that certainly is, is an important area. I suppose uh, uh, if, on that particular area, uh, we have just listened to, to Ahmed. Um, perhaps uh, I, I, I can also invite uh, uh, Diani to also speak on that. Uh, are you seeing a, a particular trend in terms of, you know, uh, migration to digital payment? And what sort of you know new initiatives uh, will be coming up, or we'll be seeing the market that can help expedite the process? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, 
the, the regulator's role in terms of driving that, um, you know, that sort of incentive from a transaction pricing perspective has been a, a really good one in this instance. And that's that's really, as I mentioned earlier, kind of showing in terms of the elasticity and people starting to adopt uh, more digital payments than they previously would have otherwise. Um, and the point of just raised around EKYC and, and sort of enabling onboarding. Um, of course, we're kind of challenged on the EKYC front in markets where we don't have national ID registry, right? So that's uh, one of the backbones and in India has been talked about a little bit already in the session, but having that, that type of um, infrastructure is, is kind of crucial to players like us. Um, but absolutely, we're seeing you know immense adoption. For example, we launched a new um, service for SMEs uh, where they could kind of use the app to do a whole range of services as well as on onboard themselves. And we've seen kind of within a few weeks, 100,000 SMEs in Kenya alone kind of you know, starting to to use the service um, digitally. And, and we're seeing that migration that would have otherwise taken you know many many quarters uh, to see that kind of adoption. So um, absolutely across the board. Digitization is, is picking up, um, and I think we need more support um, in terms of those kind of core enablers like digital ID. I think certainly uh, digital ID is, is is the foundation of everything. Uh, you need the, to have the foundation before you can move on. After authentication, then before you can uh, get get the payment done, certainly. Well, uh, I actually uh, spot another another question. Uh, it's about uh, the, uh, the trade off between market dominance and financial inclusion because uh, 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 the observations from some you know emerging market is that uh, usually we we do see a big players you know uh, taking up a, a big market share in a particular area. Uh, uh, of course, that pair would deliver you know the beneficial effect of you know financial inclusion. Well, of course, there will be the concern about dominance and, and competition. For this question, I'd like to 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 ask John, uh, what what's your view on this? Is it is it an inevitable, you know, you know, uh, process to go through that uh, we there will be first, you know, market dominance uh, for for better inclusion, and then early later on, fine regulation will need to to step in to kind of you know correct the process. John, do you have any will? Sure. So I, I don't think it's inevitable. I think that certainly the you know a great means of enhancing inclusion is to make sure we have competition. If multiple institutions are vying for the same you know, customers, whether they're you know, currently banked or unbanked, that's of course a, a great you know, guarantee that services will improve and prices will decline. And there's even economic literature showing that you know this neck-on-neck -neck competition between different providers is actually good in the long run for promoting innovation. So Agion and others uh, have. You know, competition and innovation link. So um, I think that you know th this is the key issue. Um, when big tech enters financial services initially, you know, just by uh, mechanics, uh, that increases competition. But uh, because of the network effects and you know these fixed costs that I discussed earlier, there is the potential for competition actually to decline over time, and preventing you know this uh, this hampering of competition. You know, making sure that the Level playing field stays there, and the marketplace remains competitive. It's important, and I think there are, as, as we've discussed, proactive steps that authorities can take to make sure that competition remains in place. To make sure that you know big techs, banks, fintech startups can all uh, compete with one another and, and provide you know, best services to end users. And I think that you know the right policies should mean that we don't have a trade-off here, but that we have a complementary um, complementary policy goals. Enhancing competition, ensuring innovation, and enhancing financial inclusion. Thank you, John. Uh, well, uh, that's quite. Uh, uh, I, I I do share with you actually. Uh, it may not be an inevitable, you know, step. Uh, that uh, uh, market dominance must precede uh, financial inclusion. I think um, we certainly, after what we have learned from the different markets and also what we experience in our uh, own market, there certainly is some sort of you know uh, policy uh, remedies or, or policy precautionary measures that we can do. But um, uh, let let's uh, see uh, how we can you know collaborate and discuss to come up with something useful uh, to help up with the you know uh, developing markets. 
Well, I think I think uh, we we've come to the end of this um, uh, Q and A section, and uh, thank you very much for all the participants' questions, and also thank you very much for the panelists for sharing with us uh, all, all your comments and and, and insights. And uh, I think we have also almost come to the end of this you know uh, workshop today, and uh, perhaps uh, I can uh, pass it over to Tom. If you would like to say a few words uh, uh, before we close the the uh, the workshop, I understand perhaps uh, we would have uh, uh, Masari of uh, summer to actually share with us some uh, uh, comments or the views about uh, the big tent you know uh, uh, area. Is that true? Uh, yes, Colin, thank you very much. And um, uh, so uh, I won't take too much of your time nearing the end of this uh, very informative workshop. Uh, I'll just give you maybe some insights into the G20 discussions on the very same uh, subject. Uh, so um, uh, uh, originally, and I won't rehash what I uh, discussed yesterday because I think we have a uh, very similar audience, but the work on big tech with a focus on emerging markets developing economies was a part of a, a broad package that included the use of uh, technology in both the uh, regulation regulated entities and also the work on cross-border payments and if i can just zero in on uh, what I've, i found to, this to be a very interesting discussion on the international uh, collaboration aspect of uh, today's discussion which is really what we wanted to do uh, throughout the g20 process and i think Dirk brought up a really good point with the innovation hubs and getting comfortable with the field of technology. So uh, when we first uh, discussed this idea on uh, the work of Big Tech, the work of RegTech and SubTech, there was uh, some pushback that this might be too dry for G20 discussions. And uh, I think uh, throughout the year, uh, we proved that these discussions are uh, both interesting, they're full of questions and very ambiguous areas and we should really start getting the discussion started on the highest of levels. And to John's point as well on the importance of international collaboration, the role of the FSB, I think the FSB serves as a valuable forum and he rightly mentioned the regional consultative groups. We wanted these discussions to be as inclusive as possible from the onset of uh, the G20 year. So we worked very closely with the FSB Secretariat and ensured that we can also consult the regional consultative groups that really give us uh, a wider network to consult on issues pertaining to uh, big techs and uh, rec tech, soup tech. Uh, a good, uh, I, I just want to, I guess, uh, top it off with uh, a point mentioned by uh, Liz on cross-border payments. So the roadmap on cross-border payments is really part of the narrative that we wanted to get across. This uh, changing financial ecosystem is bringing in different stakeholders, uh, uh, serving uh, possibly different interests, but with the same uh, main goal. So in the roadmap to cross-border payments, we have a uh, 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 ample room for uh, private sector consultation, but we're also going to incorporate their uh, work through their respective forums. And there's also collaborative processes with the fintech community through routine tech sprints to innovate solutions to inform uh, uh, the work and possibly tangible solutions with the work on uh, cross-border payments. And I think uh, these discussions are difficult, but they're necessary to have just given the cross-border nature of uh, the financial system that we're seeing uh, evolve and there's room uh, to learn from one another and that was included in that uh, very useful report on the use of RegTech and SubTech and I just want to thank you all uh, Colin, Tom, uh, the speakers today uh, for uh, another uh, a second day of really some uh, great and uh, interesting discussions and I hope everybody has a great day. Sorry, that's a lot. So uh, I think uh, we've uh, literally come to the end of this, you know, workshop today. And uh, thank you all for, you know, joining us and all the panelists uh, and all the participants. And hope we, we've uh, 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 something you know, very useful insights and comment out of this, you know, workshop today. And uh, uh, Tom, I'm not sure whether you've got uh, uh, any other things to, to add. No, only to say thank you to you, Colin, uh, to all of the speakers, uh, to Shari and to the FSB Secretariat. Uh, it's been uh, to you all and hearing from you all. And um, yeah, I hope you all have a nice day.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.